Monty, and this is McGaconori. The tale I'm going to tell you today is taken from this book here, A Bit About Me by George Migaki. So let's get set down and we'll begin. <laughs> Eureka! exclaimed Muller. What is it Muller? I inquired just a few weeks before my third birthday. I think I've come up with the most amazing flask idea ever. Mother, I have yet to turn three years old. Why would I be interested in anything that is flask related? Because this invention will help shape your life. I'm almost certain that I shall now be able to send you to the finest school that money can afford. I am overcome with joy. That was a conversation I had with Mother at the moment she invented the Thermos Roughneck Flask. Which was a square plastic flask that came with kids' lunch boxes. Thanks to this, my parents were able to send me to the League of Doom Academy, where I would spend nine years of my life. In August 1980, aged five and a bit, I entered the primary building for the very first time. My form master, Dr. Nemesis, introduced himself to the class. Good morning, students. I am Dr. Nemesis, and I will be your form master for the forthcoming four years. In this time, I shall teach you algebra and the science of crisp flavoring for six hours a day, 365 days a year, purely by mind control. The other 18 hours a day will be spent working your way through the SRA colors. Anyone who does not reach gold level by May 1984 shall be incinerated by the flamethrowers incorporated into my eyes. Is that understood? Yes, sir, said my classmates and I in unison. Most people in the class managed to reach the gold level by 1983, which was seen as quite an achievement. But, thanks to my high command of the English language, I had reached Super Platinum by 15 September 1980. So for the remainder of my days in the primary building, I read the entire works of Danielle Steele, including books she hadn't even written yet. In August 1984, my classmates and I moved to the secondary building, where we spent the next three years. In the secondary building, we had two form masters, Doomlord from the Eagle Comics and Eric Bristow. In the mornings, Doomlord would teach us pyrotechnics, while in the afternoons, Mr. Bristow would give us advanced darts. The remainder of the day would be spent making statues out of sick. For our final exam, we had to build an Austin Allegro using parts which we had stolen from Mr. T. This was an arduous task, as Mr. T didn't own any Austin Allegro parts, but we managed to improvise with flying colours. August 1987 saw me enter my apprenticeship year, where for 12 months I would learn the ins and outs of the boat sabotaging industry. For 18 hours a day, I would dismantle outboard motors. The other six hours were spent training ducks to nibble rudders. Then, in August 1988, I entered my final year at the League of Doom Academy in the University Building. It was there that I learned my subsequent trade, as I gained my doctorate in rubber stamp manufacturing. Indeed, I even gained a merit for manufacturing a rubber stamp that could morph into a gun at the flick of an ink pad. 14th of May 1989 saw my proudest moment to date as I graduated from the League of Doom Academy with my doctorate and a special achievement award for my prowess in grouse startling. As was a tradition in those days, every graduate's cap was doffed by the principal, Roger Daltrey, and then we would take turns at stabbing Debbie Gibson, the former pop singer. 
The ceremony was then followed by a huge party, with guest of honour being Toby Anstis. I'll never forget the day when myself and my best friend, Ontario Bodega, discovered the secret of eternal life. It was the summer of 1984, and we just earned a day of remission from the primary building, thanks to our invention of a brand new flavour of Jacob's Club biscuits. So Ontario and I decided to spend a day by the school lake, throwing wham bars to the swordfish Gibraltar Bill. Gibraltar Bill loved wham bars, although his favourite food was McCowan's Highland Toffee. But sadly, the branch of fine fare in the school foyer was sold out on that particular day. It seems that Dr Nemesis had heard there was going to be a shortage of McCowan's Highland Toffee, and being the panic shopper that he was, he bought up the entire stock, and he hid it in the memory. Anyway, Ontario was trying to unwrap the last of the wham bars, when a sliver of the wrapper got stuck to the bar. This led him to theorise and contemplate life as a whole. I decided to join in, because quite frankly, once you've seen a swordfish and devour 833 wham bars, it all gets a bit samey. What's up, Ontario? I asked of my friend. I'm not sure, said Ontario. I know we are merely nine years old, but seeing that sliver of wrapper sticking to that wham bar has got me questioning the universe. I mean, what is life all about, deep down, when you come to think of it? I think it's about being alive, was my reply. What would you say would be the secret of eternal life, then? retorted Ontario. Hmm, I don't know. I suppose the best way to live forever would be by not dying, was the best answer I could come up with. And when we thought about it, we realised that we may have stumbled upon something. And so we abandoned the lake and headed toward the library. Well, when I say we headed, what we actually did was farm a lift from a passing leopard because Granza stool covered 93.765678 square miles. And although the library was right next to the lake, we were on a remission day, and walking would have defeated the purpose. Upon arrival at the library, we looked up life in the dictionary, and then in an encyclopedia. We then did the same for death. On realising that life and death were the opposite of each other, we sold our secret of everlasting life to NASA for $65 billion and a porter cabin full of McCowan's Highland toffee. Tragically, we didn't get to see the toffee because Dr Nemesis stole it all, still believing in the shortage rumour. And that is how Ontario Bodega and I discovered the secret of eternal life. Every word of it is true, and if you don't believe me, you can ask NASA. They'll back it up, no bother. The rigours of the League of Doom's education system meant that we had to attend classes 365 days a year. Come rain, hail, snow, meteor storm, or shine. The only breaks that we were given were remission days, where we would be rewarded for confectionery-based discoveries, and three two-week summer holiday breaks, which we were awarded in 1983, 1987, and 1988. And so it was that in July 1983, after two long years of mind control and Danielle Steele, I was reunited with my family. I'll always remember that day, leaving the school gates, bucket and spade in one hand, dead tortoise in the other. Gillespie, my father's Batman, picked me up in a stretch bin lorry, and he drove me back to the family estate. I was greeted at the door by my dear mother, who welcomed me with open arms and a flask in the shape of Dolph Lundgren. I'm very touched by this gesture, Mother, I said in a rather pretentious manner, 
but I must admit to having absolutely no idea who Dolph Lundgren is. Don't worry about it, my child, said Mother, in a sweet way that always melted my insecurities away. Dolph Lundgren is an actor who will one day be very famous for a short while before paling into straight-to-video obscurity. That is a heartbreaking tale. It certainly is. But his profile will resurface in the next century when he appears in The Expendables and its sequels. After that reassurance, my heart is filled with joy. We were then joined by my father, fresh from his mayoral duties. Hello, father, I said. Middle child of mine, said father. It is a pleasure to feast my eyes upon you after almost three years. Please accept this gift. What is it? I inquired, taking a large golden key from my father's grasp. As Lord Mayor of Troton, it is my duty to hand you the key to Montrose. Use it wisely, lest there be any kind of shenanigans. Now, if you shall excuse me, I must depart, as I have video recorded the entire 1982-83 series of Bullseye on the Betamax, and I must watch it before my evening supper with Tony Green. And with those words, Father departed. I decided I would go in search of my brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, my brothers and sisters were on their own summer holidays, where they spent their time nailing radishes to pianos at a local blackboard factory. And so mother, father and I boarded a private jet and headed to Gdansk for the 1983 water polo championships. Upon our return from Gdansk, I was bundled into a sack and dragged back to the League of Doom, where I would spend the next four years pining for Romela Grobovnik, the captain of the Soviet women's water polo team. By 1987, when I was next allowed home, I had finally outgrown my desire for retribution against Dmitry Brodnitska, Romela's husband. Again, Gillespie met me at the school gates, and my mother greeted me, this time with a spacesuit and tickets to see Bobby Crush live at the Glasgow Pavilion. Sadly, Father couldn't see me at all during the duration of my holiday, as he was overseeing the signing of the Franco-Liverpool Peace Treaty so I spent a whole two weeks putting roll mops in tins by the Sea of Tranquility. I was disappointed to find out while I was up there that Dolph Lundgren had already started his famous phase and that by the next time I would be allowed home, he would already be heading for obscurity. I made a point of booking a private screening of Rocky IV and Masters of the Universe when I returned from the moon. But I was bundled into a sack and dragged back to the League just before Stallone made his dreadful EVERYONE CAN CHANGE speech. Summer 1988 arrived. At this time, Gillespie was not there to greet me. Instead, Father turned up in person, and the two of us jumped into his authentic Starsky and Hutch Grand Torino, and we spent the next two weeks in Wales, shouting at geese. Some people say that the school days are the best days of their lives but my summer holidays certainly ran them a close second. Well, sadly, that's all we've got time for today, boys and girls. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow for the continuation of the story. If you can't manage that, then I suggest you buy this book. It's only £3.99, and the, all the money goes to a good cause, because I am absolutely skint. <laughs> Skid, skid. Sounds a bit like bent, bent. That's the worst one yet. Goodbye.